On the 12th of October, 1988, Melbourne would be rocked by the news of a vicious double shooting. It was cold-blooded. It was planned. It was an execution. The victims were two innocent police officers investigating an abandoned car. I just sat in the back of the ambulance and just cried and thought, this is pointless. I'm not guilty of these charges. The investigation into the shootings would uncover a tale of revenge. She kept saying, help, help, McLaren, help, help, help me. Violence and deceit. My husband's in They believed that uh, the police were out to, to get them and, uh, and they decided uh, then and there that it was going to be two for one. For every, every criminal that was killed, they'd kill two police. The brutal murders of two young police officers on Wall Street were crimes that shook Australia. Melbourne in the 1980s for a detective was probably the most volatile it's ever been. If I look back, it was almost like a Western movie where you'd shoot first and ask questions later. That was the behaviour of the police back then because they were quite often confronted with very, very violent men. The vast majority of criminals still had a begrudging respect for the police. But with some of the armed robbery crews, they felt that they were in a competition with another gang, and that gang was the armed robbery squad. There'd been bombings of police, there'd been shootings of police. Police felt they were in some ways under attack. There's been a second explosion unit. Stay away from the area. These groups would case banks sometimes have inside information and they would hit them with military precision. In the case of the armed robbery crew known as the Flemington crew, two of their associates had been killed by police. The police were told at that point that the Flemington crew had started to suggest that they'd been targeted and that they were going to fight back. It was then they learned of what was called the two for one. You take one of our people, we'll take two of you. It was in this brooding and volatile atmosphere that the seeds were sown for one of the most tragic incidents ever to befall the Victoria Police. To try and combat the spate of increasingly violent crimes, Victoria Police's armed robbery squad began to focus their attention on key figures in Melbourne's underworld. The armed robbery squad had been targeting a number of criminals they went out in, on the 11th of October to make an arrest on a fellow called Graham Jensen. And that really started a bleak period in, uh, in Victoria's history. Graham Jensen was a charismatic and violent criminal. Jensen was wanted in relation to an attempted murder of a security guard. They followed him to an area in Narry Warren and they more or less bungled the arrest. As a career criminal, he was wanted for many things, but the arrest that day at Narry Warren was for something he didn't do. Police chasing him, fired at the car, fired through the back windscreen and hit him in the head, killing him instantly. To Melbourne's armed robbers, the death of Graham Jensen was viewed as nothing less than an execution by the robbery squad detectives. Their threat to avenge the death of one of their own by killing two police was about to become very real. Graham Jensen was very close to Victor Pearce, who was the main organiser for the Flemington crew. As soon as his crew knew that Graham Jensen had been killed by police, they believed it was murder and they responded in kind. There was grief and there was anger and very quickly they started to plan revenge. Later that evening, there was a gathering of all of his friends in this apartment in Brunswick 
and the flat was owned by Victor Pearce's sister. A number of his friends turned up there and, and were getting the news that Graham had been shot dead. They were putting together a piece of their puzzle. Of course, Crook's puzzles aren't necessarily always correct. They believed that the police were out to, to get them and they decided uh, then and there that it was going to be two for one. For every criminal that was killed, they'd kill two police. Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre were two relatively junior police officers serving with the Victoria Police. Tynan was 22 and had joined the force three years earlier. Constable Damien Eyre. 20-year-old Damien Eyre came from a police family and had served for less than 12 months. Damien grew up wanting to be a policeman. Nothing else. Water to be joined the police force. Spent most of his kid days at the police station, belting on the old Olivetti typewriters. Got a collection of uh, police journals and just was just crazy about wanting to be a policeman. Steve really enjoyed his his job. I think helping people, you know, working in with the community. I said to him, well, as long as you have compassion, Steve, you'll be right. And, and he did. He was very compassionate. The two young police officers were based at Paran Police Station, the district headquarters for Melbourne's inner city suburbs. That October evening, they were assigned the call sign Paran 311. Their divisional van pulled out of Paran Police Station car park at 11.10 that night. Graham Jensen had been dead for less than eight hours. It was a typical sort of night shift for two young coppers and in an inner city beat. They went to a noisy party, a, an alarm, someone complaining about being beaten up by their husband. Those sort of jobs went through the night and then they got to the ninth case of the night. It was a quiet night. And then uh, a call came in that there's um, an abandoned car in Wall Street with the doors open. Wall Street is a small street in an affluent area of Melbourne. I got on the radio and called for any unit available. 3311. 3311, if you can slip down to Walsh, Wall Street in uh, South Yarra. The closest police that could take the call was a Paran unit, manned by Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre. There's a white Holden sedan, not knowing what the rego is, but the lights on and the smashed windows in the middle of the road. Yeah, France for 11, please, that's 26483. Roger. Constables Tynan and Eyre arrived in Wall Street and parked their van behind the abandoned car. I don't know how long the interval was, but Sometime later, there was calls coming through that shots were fired in Wall Street. Uh, South Melbourne 150, I sent uh, Pran 311 down to Wall Street. Uh, uh, there's a, a car, a white Holden sedan, parked in the middle of the road with a lights on the smashed windows. Um, since then, I've had about three or four cars come down saying that they've heard shots fired in that street, and I can't get Pran 311 at this stage. When the calls came through from the public about shots fired, I immediately was, was concerned and um, I kept calling Pran 311 and anybody else in the area to check just to check out their, their welfare. It was cold-blooded, it was planned, it was an execution. As the 1980s drew to a close, Melbourne was in the grip of a bloody war that was raging between Victoria Police's armed robbery squad and a group of organised and heavily armed bank robbers. Tragically, on the 12th of October, 1988, two young police officers found themselves caught up right in the middle of the conflict. At 4.39 a.m., 
Constable Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre responded to reports of an abandoned car in Wall Street, South Yarra. This is such a routine matter. Go and have a look at a running sheet on any divisional van and you'll see dozens of these sort of events. Nondescript, routine. That's what made it so terrifying. They were junior police, but no police officer going to that scene. They could be 30-year veterans would have suspected anything. A car in the middle of the road, abandoned. It happens every day. But this day, it was an ambush. And this day, it was cold-blooded murder. They pulled up behind the stolen car. Damien went to the registration label on the passenger side, wrote down the registration number and the expiry date. One got into the front seat and was looking at where the, the car had been jimmied to start it. And the other, his, his colleague squatted on the road beside him, talking to him by the open front door. The offenders walked out of under a block of flats. Stephen Tynan was shot close range to the head with a shotgun. Damien Eyre was shot across the back. He turned and struggled with the offender with a shotgun. The shotgun went off. He hit a wall in a house adjacent on the second storey. His revolver then was then taken from his holster and he was shot once through the head, close range. And when he fell to the ground, he was shot through the back and side that perforated his heart. When we first arrived, there were a number of police units already on scene. We were the first ambulance crew to arrive and followed shortly after by an intensive care ambulance. The first officer I attended to was Steve Tynan. He'd been um, shot in the back of the head with a shotgun. The second officer, Damien, had been shot in the back with shotgun from, from some distance. So then we've, more so for the, for the sake of his, his mates, we've intubated Steve and scooped him up and took him to Prince Henry's Hospital. And the other crew took Damien to the Alfred Hospital. Where they were both unfortunately pronounced dead on arrival at hospital. This case really affected, really upset, really hurt, because it was two of our mates. We might not have known them personally, but the comrades in uniform. I just sat in the back of the ambulance and just cried and thought, this is pointless. Now, while police had to keep an open mind, straight away, the first and the strongest theory was, this is a payback for what happened just 12 hours earlier. As detectives mobilised and began the daunting task of investigating the murders of two of their own, it was immediately apparent that they faced a challenging case. Unfortunately, uh, when you go to, to crime scenes, um, particularly from, uh, you know, from a homicide point of view, invariably uh, a lot of those scenes have been contaminated. They're not uh, protected the way, uh, the way you would like to. The scene for, for Wall Street was one of disarray, disorganised, and it hadn't been protected the way in which we wanted it to, to be. We'd had bodies moved and the crime scene contaminated by probably emotions overriding judgment, which was probably humanly understandable, but from an investigator's point of view, very troublesome for us to try and reconstruct what had actually taken place. Meanwhile, other officers were sent to carry out a much more difficult task. I remember just standing still in front of the TV because I heard about this police shooting and, uh, and then going to bed after that and then the next morning, you know, hearing a knock. I looked out and saw two police, so, you know, that was 
uh, them coming to tell me about it. Yeah, it was about oh, probably 4.30 in the morning, a bit after. <clears throat> there was a knock on the door and you know, yeah, immediately something wrong. They told me that there'd been a shooting and said that uh, he and Steve Don were dead. So we uh, jumped in the police car and went to Melbourne. Went to Paran and uh, they were marvellous. Sorry. I think it was a couple of days later that I just decided I have to say the words because I've got to acknowledge it. I knew I just had to acknowledge it. And I just said the words, Stephen is dead. And it sounds very, you know, silly, but that seemed to help me. As the task force, now named Thai Air, in memory of the fallen officers, began to assemble, they were well aware of the pressures they were under. The outpouring of grief and outrage from the general community, from the Premier down, um, was really impacted on the whole community. And within the police force, there was anger and there was a line in the sand, you cannot do this, we need to find these people. When police are killed, the public would be quite right to think that uh, the, the police would react with all guns blazing, so to speak. They would pull out every, every stop to make sure that they caught the culprits. With the Wall Street killing, it was probably a little bit different. Police command took the approach that they didn't want the police reaction to Wall Street to be seen by the public as anything over and above what they would do if it was two ordinary members of the public. Setting up with the task force was a frustrating period. Um, I was the homicide squad at that stage. It wasn't until 10 days afterward that we were actually given any resources whatsoever. They didn't have computers, they didn't have analysts. So all these information reports were coming in, all this intelligence was coming in, all these police wanted to help, but there was really no way of marshalling the intelligence. Despite these challenges, the task force was making progress, and to the detectives, the same names were being mentioned, names they were well aware of. The notorious bank robbers known as the Flemington Crew. Jensen was a member of the Flemington Crew, and as a result of him being killed, that was certainly one motive. This theory received at least partial corroboration when officers checked the records of unsolved crimes involving shotguns. One case in particular stood out, an armed robbery at the Oak Park Bank in March 1988, seven months before the murders. Three robbers went in and immediately the security screens came down, so they needed to get through the door. They had a sledgehammer, that didn't work, so they fired two shots into the door. And that produced shotgun shells that had special markings on them when they were ejected and left. So when forensics came along after the bank robbery, they were there to pick up. At the scene of Walsh Street, shotgun shells had been fired. And it was a shotgun where each time you fire a shot, the shell pops out and it lies on the floor. It was dark, so they weren't picked up by the killers. So forensically, they were examined. And what was special about these shotgun shells was not the mark that fired it, but it's the scratching as they came out of the gun. And those scratchings as they came out of the gun in Wall Street were identical to those scratchings on the, on the shells in the Oak Park Bank. It was the same gun. There was a direct link now between a gang of bank robbers and the Wall Street murders. The gun was later found buried on a Melbourne golf course, although its condition meant it couldn't be tied to one person through fingerprints alone. But at least there was now a forensic link between the Wall Street murders and the Flemington crew bank robbers. In an effort to find more evidence and arguably send a clear message to Melbourne's crooks, a series of raids took place across the city for weeks after the shootings. On one day, in December 1988 alone, over 100 police officers descended on shops, businesses and homes. Although the raids provided little in the way of specific evidence, police were presented with a key witness, teenage gangster Jason Ryan, 
the nephew of Flemington crew mastermind, Victor Pierce. Jason Ryan was a 17 year old at the time uh, of the Wall Street killings. Jason had been involved in burglaries and he was a thief, he was a drug taker. Jason came to us in the early days as a result of a raid and he was a very sort of sickly, pathetic sort of young kid who, with, a, with a rotten background. This is a kid who would be woken up and told to clean up bloodstains in the house where, where there'd been a murder at the age of 12 or 13, who had firearms hidden in his bedroom. He was known to talk under a little bit of pressure. He came into police custody, into witness protection, and he had interview after interview. And each interview, his involvement got more complex. Whilst Ryan was quick to tell what he knew about the shootings, the problem for police was that his account kept changing every time he spoke to the detectives. Is what you've told us today the truth about what happened at Wall Street? Yeah. So he'd gone from hearing something in his mother's flat, which was probably very interesting for us. He then put himself at the crime scene, told of who killed the police and how it actually happened, what guns were used. On the 31st of October, 1988, Ryan was charged with murder for his involvement in the Wall Street shootings and was bailed into police protective custody. Police hoped that the mounting pressure on the young gangster would lead to him providing yet more information. A similar tactic was used on another figure on the periphery of the gang, 20-year-old Anthony Farrell. Anthony Farrell, again, was a well-known criminal, but on a smaller scale than the others. He certainly wasn't a member of the Flemington crew. He was a uh, drug taker more of a small-time thief. Andy Farrell was a young boy mixing with older criminals. He came from a family that was, uh, had some criminal associates, and he got himself caught up in something that was probably well beyond him. Jason Ryan claimed that Farrell was involved in the planning of the shootings. Thinking that it would intensify pressure on the youngster to talk, police charged Anthony Farrell with murder. Ryan would go on to name another four members of the Flemington crew he claimed were directly involved in the shooting of Tynan and Eyre. Jason Ryan took us down to Wall Street. We did a number of reenactments with him where he would tell us certain things that turned out to be untrue. So anything he told us, we would want to corroborate. Over a period of time, he finally gave us uh, a version that, that we believe to be the, uh, the correct version involving Peter McAvoy Victor Pearce, Jed Horton, Anthony Farrell, and to a lesser degree, Trevor Penningill. He um, told us that they had been the ones involved in murdering Steve Tyner and Damien Eyre. And what was the, um, the plan uh, by everyone when you came here? You come here to ambush the police. Victor Pearce was the main offender out of the Flemington crew. He was the leader of the group, he was the planner, the organiser uh, and the main, the main stay of that group. With Jason Ryan naming the alleged perpetrators in the plot, five men became suspects in the killings. Victor Pierce, Peter McAvoy, Jed Horton, Trevor Pettingill and Anthony Farrell. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of these charges. I've done nothing wrong. I do not carry guns when I report to police stations. Although he was cooperating with the police, doubt remained over the value of Jason Ryan's statement. After all, he told detectives several versions of his story. Within the ranks of the task force, there were concerns that a jury simply wouldn't believe him. But in November 1988, as police continued to assemble their case, their investigation was rocked by news of more shootings. With Melbourne still reeling from the brutal murders of two young police officers on Wall Street in October 1988, the task force formed to identify the killers were desperate to find the missing pieces of the puzzle that would lead to convictions. Five men, Victor Pierce, Peter McAvoy, Anthony Farrell, Trevor Pettingill, and Jed Horton, 
were the prime suspects in the murders. Horton was a violent bank robber, and police were convinced he had a major role in the murders. But he had disappeared. When police tracked him down to a caravan park a month after the shootings, they moved in to arrest him. He'd been hiding out uh, in Bendigo. He'd still been active in his armed robberies uh, right up until Wall Street. He had seven firearms in the caravan at the time. The police tried to effect the arrest. He raised a weapon, tried to shoot the, the SWAT guys coming in through the door. Shots were fired. All the shots that were fired were police rounds. Jed Horton was shot dead. That killing caused further resentment and anger in, in the underworld, who thought that it was just a way of levelling the score. There was controversy in the killing of Jed Horton, absolute controversy. Front page news all around Australia, police kill another one. And it was controversy that, I, I guess, that in hindsight, it was warranted. Everyone went out in open arms, screaming and yelling abuse at the police. It was the, probably the most heated part of the entire investigation was the killing of Jed Horton. But there was worse to come. There was one more shooting, and that was Gary Abdallah. Gary Abdallah was a known associate of the Flemington crew, a convicted car thief who police believed had also been involved in bank robberies. In his statement, Jason Ryan had implicated Abdallah claiming the 24-year-old father of one actually provided the getaway vehicle on the night of the shootings. We believed that he had critical information that could certainly involve Victor Pierce, Peter McAvoy, Jed Horton in particular, and that he had supplied a, a getaway vehicle for them. With the police activity intensifying, Abdallah went to ground. He was eventually traced by the Wall Street detectives, but his interview yielded no clues. Two months later, Gary Abdallah was shot and critically wounded by police. He was arrested by police not connected with the Wall Street Task Force. He was taken back to his flat. They would give sworn evidence that he produced what they thought was a firearm and pointed it at the police. One of the police then emptied his six-shot Smith & Wesson revolver and then grabbed his colleagues and fired another shot. Abdullah suffered fatal injuries. He lived for a number of days before he died. The firearm that Abdullah is alleged to have pointed at the police was a replica. It wasn't a real gun. So there was much angst over this. Why would someone do that? For the task force, Gary Abdullah's death meant another potential source of information about the Wall Street murders was lost. Despite the confidence in their case against the remaining suspects, police were desperate for another source of information that would help secure a conviction. They would find it in the most unlikely of places. Well, just for the record, could you just please state your full name? Wendy Margaret Pierce. Wendy Pierce was the wife of Victor Pierce. She'd been a member of the family for, for a long time. She was certainly an avid supporter of the Flemington crew. She certainly assisted in the preparation of, of many of their offences. She enjoyed the spoils of what they did. She lived the life of a gangster's wife. He committed armed robberies. He went to work like you and I. Every morning he'd get up and he'd go out. And would be, today might be surveillance of banks. Tomorrow might be uh, getting firearms. And Thursday might be actually doing the job. And she would cook tea and he'd come home and he would confide. She was considered to be an incredibly valuable person to us. If we could roll her over, she potentially she would have been, without doubt, the best Crown witness or the best rollover witness we could ever hope for. Wendy Pierce's life was crashing down. Her husband Victor was now one of the prime suspects in the Wall Street murder case, and he was facing years in prison for other armed robbery offences. Sensing she could be exploited, police tried to persuade her to turn against her husband and his gang. Her husband was jailed. She found it really hard to live by herself. Police started raiding her house again and again and again. She got into a fight and spent 10 weeks in jail. Her husband was locked up, her house had been taken by police, and she was very vulnerable. And at that point, police started talking to her. No one's forced you to uh, 
No, I'm here on my own free Come with us. Yes. Wendy Pearce made the approach to the task force. She was prepared to talk and did tell exactly what happened the night of Graham Jensen, the discussions, the reaction by, by Victor and other criminals that she was aware of to the news that Graham had been killed. She was aware of the discussions in regard to the payback. She was with Victor that night. She was able to give evidence of Victor leaving and returning some early hours of the morning after the shooting of Steve Tyne and Damien Eyre. I've been married to Victor for 13 years. I've um, always been an alibi for Victor. So Cole McLaren was central to Wendy Pearce becoming a Crown witness and, and giving evidence. He worked and worked and worked on Wendy and was the one who convinced her to come over and give evidence. But she wasn't falling off the edge just yet. She needed another little bit of a push. I found some love letters between Victor and one of her friends to show that Victor was a, had been unfaithful to her. So she was livid and she was on the edge. We had her on the edge of rolling over. Someone saw Wendy talking to detectives and that put Wendy at risk. And she came very close to, she believes and police believe, being killed with a hot shot of drugs. I rang Wendy and she answered the phone and she's all blurry and she just kept saying, help, help, McLaren, help, help, help me. Straight away I knew we had, we had trouble and then the phone went dead. I told my boss, David Sprague, he flew over there with other detectives and, a, and an ambulance. She was found with remnants of a syringe and she was under the influence of high potent heroin. Police managed to get her before she died and started to put her into witness protection and talk about her giving evidence against her family, her husband, her husband's friends. And at a point in that journey, she made a decision to turn and to talk. Finally, she made a statement of 31 pages where she actually identified Victor as the main perpetrator of Wall Street. She became the star witness. I made that statement because I was scared because if I didn't, Victor would kill me. He would. He would have killed me. So what are you saying? You, 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 you lied and uh, you supplied Victor George Pierce with an alibi that night when, when in actual fact, uh, the, the, uh, the truth is different. Yeah. She told this vivid story about how her husband, how Victor, had said he was going to kill two cops because of Jensen. What is the truth? The truth is Victor did get out of the bed that night. He did leave the motel. I heard him go and I heard him come back. She said that Victor had gone out that night later returned and was cold and I think there was some evidence she gave that he, he'd said that he'd whack the jacks. It uh, got up and I said, what are you, where are you going? He said, I'm going to make macaron jet to knock the uh, jacks at Kilgram. Which is our young boys, of course, tying in an air. So she was incredibly valuable to us. She was, unlike Jason Ryan, our ticket to success on this. We had to preserve her, we had to look after her and make sure we held on to her all the way to the trial. We had the wife of one of the, the key killers here who was telling us the facts. By July 1990, police had amassed enough evidence to charge four men with the Wall Street killings. Peter McAvoy, Victor Pierce, Trevor Pettingill and Anthony Farrell would face justice in court. Confident that in Wendy Pierce, the task force had a witness that would make for a cast iron case, the police began preparing for the trial in Melbourne's Supreme Court. Little did they know that the day before the trial, their case would come crashing down. The Thai Air Task Force had been assembled in the wake of the cold-blooded shooting of two young police officers, Constable Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre. As 1990 came to an end, and with court proceedings looming, the detectives on the task force were about to find out if almost two years of hard work had been worth it. We had a good, strong uh, prosecution case, but you can never tell until 
to the trial exactly what's going to happen. So we never got ahead of ourselves. The case largely relied on evidence from two key individuals who had given statements to the police. The first, Jason Ryan, was a young gangster who told police various versions of what he thought happened on the night of the killings. He had initially been charged with murder, but those charges were withdrawn 10 weeks before the committal hearing. There was a real concern within the task force about how the young criminal would be viewed by a jury. The second crucial witness was Wendy Pierce, the wife of Victor Pierce, the man police believed was the leader of the gang responsible for the killings. When Wendy first started talking to police, and before she really spilled the beans, police worked deliberately to butter her up, to be nice to her. They gave her nice hotels, they looked after her, they treated her, spoiled her a bit. They went on boat trips, yacht trips out on the bay. It was a really nice life. Wendy liked it. She actually became very affectionate with at least one of the police. And she felt like very special. But ultimately, with witness protection in those days, it's not Acapulco where you end up. It's public housing in a pretty dreary sort of life. And I don't think Wendy was really looking forward to being yesterday's flavour of the month. Meanwhile, Victor and the family, through third parties, were just getting to her all the time, saying, it's OK, you can come back. She wasn't under constant surveillance. She wasn't under constant care by the police. The police gave her far too much latitude. So she was able to make calls. She was able to go visiting people, have people visit her. She gave evidence at the committal and she starred. She went straight through it. She stuck to her story. The police were really confident. And then comes the pre-trial argument. She gets up and says, it's all a lie. Victor didn't do it. She walked in, told Justice Vincent nothing, said she wasn't going to offer any evidence. My husband's in it, and that's all I've got to say to her, okay? And it was all over. It was devastating. Wendy Pierce had spent 18 months in witness protection at a cost of around $2 million. Now, her statements were worthless. There was a strong move to put her in the box and make her a hostile witness. The prosecutor refused to do it, so she didn't give evidence. I don't know why Wendy essentially turned the way she did. Um, I suspect someone got a message to her from her husband saying that she'd be forgiven and she accepted that. And certainly after the case, they got back together. So she trusted her instinct and she got away with it. Whatever the reason for Wendy Pierce's change of heart, the Crown's case was fatally compromised. Without Wendy Pierce, we had nothing but a lying, conniving Jason Ryan. Without her testimony and with Jason Ryan's evidence being found to be at least flawed, the case was wounded. All that work, two and a half years of absolute solid work down the drain because we mishandled the most important witness we could have ever hoped for. It was without doubt the worst, worst, worst day of my police career. Despite the damning U-turn, police and prosecutors had little option other than to proceed with the case. In a trial that lasted seven weeks, it was clear that for the Crown at least, it had started to go wrong even before the jury was sworn in. The prosecution case was holed below the waterline. From then on, it became frantic to bail and bail to try and keep afloat. The police hopes lay with Jason Ryan as a witness. But the great problem was here with him was which story did you believe? The first, the second, the third? And I think it was summed up in one beautiful exchange in court where he was asked whether his name was Jason Ryan and he had to admit it wasn't. His real name's Jason Brooks. The lies just built on the lies that built on the lies. The four accused, Victor Pierce, Peter McAvoy, Trevor Pettingill and Anthony Farrell opted to give unsworn evidence. They would be asked questions by their own legal team but wouldn't face cross-examination. Predictably, they all denied any involvement in the killings. 
On the morning of the 26th of March, 1991, the jury reached a verdict. The jury deliberated for about six days before returning their verdicts. They found each of the four not guilty of the murders of Tynan and Eyre. I'm on top of the world! Get on your luck. When I heard that those four persons had been acquitted of that murder, I was very, very pissed off. And it's only because of the lies that were told. It doesn't matter how, how good your investigators are and how good a job they do, there's always these little things that can happen. I can remember coming out of the court, and, but I can remember standing on the steps and saying there's a higher justice, and I just knew it, I just knew it. I mean, these are two young men, wonderful young men, that had 50 years maybe in front of them, and someone can just go out and do that and get away with it, obviously. How can you feel? Steve Tynan and Damien Eyre deserve better than that. The families deserve better than that. The community deserve better than that. We all know what happened, but we didn't prove that beyond reasonable doubt in the jury's mind. When the verdict was announced, the accused were yelling from the dock, and uh, particularly loudmouth Gutless McAvoy was up there yelling abuse. And to give you an idea of the emotions, that when the word came out that there was an acquittal, D24 sent a message to all units. Announcement to all units, the verdict in the Wall Street trial was all four not guilty, repeat, not guilty, all units are warned, keep yourselves in control. They never found them innocent, they just found them not guilty. It meant in their minds there wasn't sufficient evidence to find them guilty. In December 1992, Wendy Pierce was found guilty of perjury after backtracking on her statement. She was sentenced to 18 months in prison. The only great pleasure I had was actually doing the brief of evidence against her for perjury and having her convicted of probably the worst case of perjury in the state of Victoria. In July 1993, just over two years after the end of the Wall Street trial, five Victoria police officers were charged with murdering Graham Jensen. Only one of those cases made it to trial. The officer was found not guilty after the jury deliberated for just 20 minutes. But for another character in the Wall Street story, fate had a different outcome in store. On the 1st of May, 2002, police responded to reports of a shooting on Bay Street in Port Melbourne. The victim had been gunned down in his car. His name was Victor Pierce. If there is such a thing as karma, it certainly caught up with Victor Pierce because he was murdered sitting in a Commodore, ambushed. It was believed he'd been the murder of a mafia drug dealer, uh, which was in fact incorrect. He hadn't done that murder at all, but was murdered in reprisal for that murder. So, lived by the sword, died by the sword. Um, it was probably a just and fair outcome for him. Following Pierce's death, his wife Wendy made a startling admission to journalist John Sylvester, where she once again changed her story. In 2005, she claimed that her husband Victor had been involved in the murders. She said Victor Pierce was the organiser and she implicated the others who'd been acquitted as the co-offenders. Wendy Pierce alleged the Wall Street killers were her husband Victor, Peter McAvoy and Jed Horton, who was later shot by the police. She also claimed Gary Abdallah was the person who stole the car that was abandoned in Wall Street. Of course, her allegations remain just that. Peter McAvoy lives in New South Wales and his not guilty verdict stands. For the families of the fallen officers, Wendy Pierce's allegations were of little comfort. They still feel only a coroner's inquest would satisfy their need for answers. There's nothing in the government records to say how they were killed because there's been no inquest. So there's nothing there, there's just two members of the police force shot dead in Wall Street. And I know who done it. And I want an answer. Thirty years after the murders of Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre, the shots fired on Wall Street in October 1988 still echo throughout the entire police force. 
I think the names time and air to Victorian policemen mean it could be me. Wall Street is a stain on the history of the Victoria Police. Not only was it a reprehensible ambush of two police, but ultimately there was no conviction. So four people got away with murder. Wall Street was one of the worst crimes Australia's ever had, no doubt. It was also probably one that left more scars internally than externally. The criminal world just marched on, got over it. Within the police department, we still have scars. We still have wounds that still fester. Sadly, this story is always remembered about the squabbles between the armed robbery squad and the underworld. And that's not right. It should be all about the loss of two young boys, the loss of innocence, the loss of Constable Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre. Let's spare a thought for them. <laughs> <laughs>